uh, among other languages. Previously at Dropbox, I recently released a book, Hands On Scala, I can check it out. Um, I've also done a lot of open source work around Am Ammonite, Nil, FastPass, Scala tags, a whole bunch of or a zoo of libraries that kind of make Scala, I think, a bit easier to use and easier to get started with. Um, so this presentation kind of has two agendas. One, it's going to be an introduction to doing useful things in the Ammonite Scala REPL. Um, most of you probably have used the Scala REPL for doing toy projects. Like I, I want to test out some syntax. I want to see what, how to the list API works. I want to do, to do with options or other small things that kind of as an experiment. But not that many people use Scala the REPL as like a real serious production tool to do accomplish real work, like what people will pay you for. And this presentation is meant to demonstrate that you can do quite a lot of things in the Scala REPL that are actually valuable. Um, and we walk through a few real world use cases that you may actually encounter in your day-to-day -day work. Um, the second agenda for this presentation is to kind of demonstrate that um, there's like a third way of using Scala. So there's a, most of you are probably using Scala for backend services, high performance, large scale, complex backend services. I think on Stack Overflow surveys, maybe 80% like of Scala programmers are using it for backend services. And for backend services, which are big and important, most people have some kind of big, big and important framework to use with them. Maybe they're using the CATS or Scala Z functional programming libraries. Maybe they're using uh, Akka reactive platform. Maybe they're using the Finagle Twitter platform, um, which is fine for backend services, but it's a lot of overhead if you just want to get something done quickly, like maybe as a script, as a command line command even, as a one-liner, I just want to do something. Um, you're not going to set up Finagle just to make one HTTP request. Whereas what this presentation is going to show you is you can in fact use Scala even if, even if you do just want to make one HTTP request and it, it, and it could be worth it even more so than using scripting languages like Python or Ruby or Bash. And you'll kind of, this presentation will show off a style of like executable pseudocode where you can look at the code even if you don't know Scala and probably guess what it's going to do and guess correctly. Then this style that scales well from large applications down to small scripts, prototypes, and even down to single line uh, REPL commands. <clears throat> So I'll be covering three main use cases of things that maybe people do not typically do, use, do using Scala. One, I'll cover web scraping. Um, this is something that people often do in using Python or JavaScript. And two, I'll, I'll do a simple GitHub project migration, migrating some issues from one GitHub project to another. And three, I'm going to do some parallel web crawling um, of the Wikipedia, of the graph of Wikipedia articles and the links between them. And if all goes well, I'll manage to get, all, get through all three use cases in the next 30 minutes using Scala, purely in the Scala REPL without, without even having an editor open. Um, so first, let's talk about web scraping. So web scraping is when someone has a website, they do not have an API, they may not want you to download all their data, but you want to go and download that data anyway. So if you have a HTML website, they're just gonna grab the data from the HTML. Um, so over here, I'm going to open up my Ammonite Scala REPL. Um, and let's open up a website that we want to scrape. Let's say, for example, we want to scrape the Wikipedia front page. Um, so as a worked example, let's say, I want to get all the important links from the in the news articles on the Wikipedia front page. So here there's something about skirmishes, some Supreme Court ruling, some ex-Brazilian president. Um, and a Burundian president. And I want to get all this data down and on, on, into my command line. How do I do that? Um, so the standard tool that most people use on the JVM is called JSOUP. So JSOUP has a website, it's a Java library. Um, and you can connect to Wikipedia. There's a good example for this uh, on the website and download stuff. Um, in order to use JSOUP in Ammonite Scala REPL, it does not come bundled, but you can import it using this import IV syntax. So it'd be like, uh, like org.jsoup, uh, colon, jsoup, colon, newest versions 1.13.1. And then I want to import, once I've imported the IV dependency, I can import the library itself. Um, and once that's done, I can immediately start using jsoup functionality to scrape the Wikipedia articles off of the internet. So let's say I assign this to doc. So wikipedia.org, that's the home page. Um, if I want to look at the doc's title, I can do so. Um, if I want to scrape in the news articles, I can do doc.select 
MP, ITN, and the way you get, these are CSS selectors. So for those who do web development, um, <clears throat> it's the same way jQuery queries things or CSS styles things. And roughly how it works in, for JSOUP is this ID, this div on the web page has ID, MP, ITN. So ha hashtag, hash means I'm selecting by ID. And then I'll just select all the bold elements within B. Um, for example, here there's a B element and within the B I'm just select the A element, which is just a, um, a link. Uh, did someone leave a comment on Zoom? Uh, Q and A. Can you use a larger font? Yes, I can use a larger font. Um, does this work? Okay, uh, hopefully this works. Um, yeah, so because this is a Java library, if I want to convert it to Scala like collections, I need to import the uh, Scala converters, which I can do as follows. Um, sorry, Java converters. Q and A, open, good, okay. Um, then I can do doc, doc dot select dot as Scala. That gives me a Scala uh, mutable buffer. And I can then pull stuff out of that. For example, for element in this mutable buffer, I want to yield, uh, let's say element dot text and element dot attribute uh, href. And just like that, I'm able to scrape some information off of the Wikipedia homepage using the Scala REPL. Um, as a second worked example, I'm going to, let's look at the Mozilla Development Network Web API documentation. <clears throat> so Mozilla has a good amount of handcrafted documentation here. Um, for example, every browser API has a page. And let's say for every, each of these pages, I want to grab the first paragraph of that page and store it somewhere. Maybe I want to use it in some uh, offline documentation. Maybe I want to add it as Scala doc to my uh, Scala JS bindings. Doesn't really matter why. I just want to grab for every single class in the Mozilla documentation, I want to grab the first paragraph of its docs. So how do I do that? Um, the same thing applies. So if I want to grab the, um, if I want to connect to this, grab the HTML for this page on Mozilla Development Network, I can just pass into jsoup.connect. Um, after that, I need to find out how can I grab these links. So let's inspect the, inspect the page. Um, elements. So I have this h2 id equals interfaces. So I can do doc dot select h2 hashtag to mean id interfaces that gets me this uh, high header. I want the two div, two elements after it. So this div, which contains all these IDs, so all these links. So dot uh, next, dot next. So that looks like gives me this div with class equals index, uh, div with class equals index. And from there, I can dot select, uh, I guess each of these fellows is, uh, a is a, just a link. Um, so if I do as Scala, um, you can see I have a list of all the links, all 972 links on this page underneath interfaces. Um, cool. So now, now that I have, I have all these links, it's straightforward to get all the URL get all the metadata. So let's say val uh, link uh, interfaces equals for, um, sorry, I need to do for uh, element in this fellow. Um, I want to yield element.text and element.attribute href. And then now I can, do, I can use this to find the um, to find the docs of each page. So for text href in interfaces, um, what do I want to do? Well, I want to let's say look at abstract range for example. 
I want to do val doc equals jsoup dot connect, and then I need to pass in the um, full URL, so the prefix plus href, and then uh, doc dot select. Um, what's the first paragraph? The first paragraph is underneath um, this div id equals content, um, and then. I guess I'm just going to do the first get find the paragraph. So as Scala and head option. And I'm just going to do take 10 so that doesn't take too long because it needs to make a bunch of HTTP requests. Uh, I think I'm missing a dot get here. So this might take a few seconds. Um, and here we are. So now we have. Um, the list of starting from the Mozilla, De Mozilla Developer Network in, uh, web documentation, we have the list of the first 10, um, the first 10 classes available to your JavaScript, as well as a HTML documentation for those classes. And if I remove this, take 10 and, con and, and just make it printed out, print line uh, scraping plus text, you can now see it just go to every single page on this sub page on this from this uh, page and just scrape all of their documentation down for you. Um, and we've done this in uh, five minutes in a handful of lines of code in the Scala repo. Um, so um, that's a web scraping. So the point of this isn't to introduce you to the idea of web scraping. I guess the point of this is to in introduce you to the idea that web scraping, although traditionally thought of as a kind of a dy dynamic language thing, people use scripts, people kind of hack something together can actually do it quite easily with Scala. And in fact, can do it more conveniently with Scala than you maybe could using Python or Ruby. I mean, you, have, you can just import the dependency, run it in your REPL, and get all your data down without having to fiddle with pip installs or global installs and packages and whatnot. Um, so that's web scraping. Um, the next thing, use case I'm going to cover is I'm going to do a small GitHub project migration um, right here in the REPL. So let's say I have two GitHub repos. Um, I have github.com lihawi uh, request Scala. I have this one. And I have github.com lihawi test. So I have an old repo with a bunch of issues. I have a new repo with no issues on it. It's new. Let's say for some reason I want to migrate all the issues from the old repo to the new repo. Um, how do I do that? So <clears throat> um, GitHub has an API which we can make use of from the Scala repo. Um, if you, what's this more chat? Uh, if you have questions, you're gonna talk. Please use the create section and throw those in there. Okay. Um, so if you do GitHub create issue, um, we'll see there's a GitHub create issue by the API. Um, there's we have an issues API. If you want to create an issue, um, it's as simple as making a post request to this URL with some JSON body. Um, okay, so. The Ammonite Scala REPL comes with some built-in functionality. Among them is there's a, it comes with a request library. You can make request.get post, et cetera, request. It also comes with a, a JSON library. So you can make small uh, JSON manipulation work um, as part of your built-in in the REPL. So like I can just make a small JSON object, stringify it, and here's some JSON. So if you want to make, uh, if you want to make a request to create an issue on this, uh, Lee Howie test uh, repo. Um, that's as simple as saying request.post. Um, and then it's https api.github.com slash repos slash Lee Howie slash test as issues. Um, and then data equals, I'm going to pass in the JSON object with title goes to hello, uh, body goes to world. I can pass in more arguments here if I wish to. Um, and lastly, I need to pass in some a, a token. So because GitHub requires authorization, you can't just create issues willy nilly. Um, so tokens, tokens. Um, so this doesn't work because I haven't defined a token. I'm just going to say my token. I'm going to read it from disk. OSRE, OSRE, PWD. Uh, 
home slash github token dot txt dot trim. So here are my token. I'm not going to show it to you, but it's there. And now when I make this HTTP request, I get 201 created and I have, I have a GitHub issue. Here we go. Um, and GitHub has a similar thing for me for doing comments as well. So um, if you do like GitHub API make comment, um, issue comments. So I want to make a comment on this hello issue one. I want to create an issue comment. Um, it's kind of similar. I need to post instead of two issues. I post issues, issue number one, comments. Uh, comments don't have a title. And then I am cow, hear me move. Um, I've created the comment and you can Im immediately see it here in the GitHub UI. Um, so now that we've made a made an issue and made a comment, the last thing we need to do in order to migrate our issues over is to fetch existing issues so we can make the corresponding issues in the new GitHub repository. Um, GitHub lets you list the issues. It's somewhere on this page. It's like list, list repository issues. Um, and it's easy enough. It's something like um, request.get. Um, yeah, it's a get request to almost the same URL as we were posting to. So get uh, Lihari test issues. There's nobody. It's just a request is just a get. Um, so here's my request and response. And I, I print out the response. You see the whole bunch of JSON data uh, as part of the response body. Um, so apart from HTTP, the MLX Cal REPL comes with built-in support for JSON which is convenient because 99% of third party services will have a HTTP JSON API. So for example, if I wanted to pretty print this thing, I could do a new json.read.text uh, and then that builds a data structure. I can render it back to JSON in gent equals four. <clears throat> and I can see the kinds of things which are available in the, in, the, in the issues that I fetched. For example, every issue has a number, this is number one. Uh, every issue has a title, a user that created it. Um, if I print this out more verbose, you'll, you'll see that the issue also has like a label, state, there's a body, um, and so on. So let's say I want to migrate the issue titles, issue bodies, and have some kind of like metadata to say who was the original author of the issue and what was the original issue ID. Because after I migrate them, it's all going to be under my GitHub token and my, um, my user. Um, so, what do I need to do for that? To do that, I can do, um, let's, I can save my parsed issues in a variable. I can explore it interactively. I can look at the number. Uh, number, nope. Okay, that didn't work. Uh, Cause it's an array. So if I look at the first issues number, see okay, that works. Um, if I look at the title, I can look at the body, I can look at the user and maybe get the user's login ID. Um, sorry, user and then separately login. So to convert this into a bit more structured data, I can um, just have a list comprehension for issue in parsed yield as a tuple. I want issue number dot num as an integer, uh, issue title as a string, issue body as a string, and issue uh, user login as a string. Um, map, I need to say that this is an array, so it's let me map over it. Um, so, um, you could also you could also deserialize into a case class if you want more structured data, but for now a tuple will do. Um, this seems to be the new repository. So I actually want to do this using the data from the old repository. So instead of using um, request or get from the test repo, I should request get from the request Scala repo. Um, and then do the same thing, parsed, uh, and then issue data. Then now I can see uh, I have 13 items here. Um, so that's what we'd expect. 
So now that we have the <clears throat> data from the old repository, um, and we've, we already know how to create issues and comments in the new repository, it's a simple for loop to create issues in the new repository based on what was on the old one. So for every number, title, body, and user that we fetched from, uh, I called it issue data. Um, <clears throat> what do I want to do? I'm just going to print line creating issue plus uh, copying issue with what's up on the number. Uh, do the same request dot post. Um, HTTPS api.github.com slash repos slash rehawi slash test slash issues. Um, data is going to be a uJSON object. Uh, title goes to the title. And uh, body goes to uh, the old body plus the ID of the old issue plus the original author user. Um, then I guess last thing you pass in the authorization headers. So map authorization goes to as token token. And then I'm going to just return the number and the new issue number, which is going to be uea.read response.text uh, number dot number dot two int. So now if I run this, if all goes well, um, <clears throat> it should be copying over issues. And if I compare the old uh, old repo to the new repo. Um, you see that the issues are all there. Um, yeah. yeah, so it seems like it, the, the issues are copied over in re reverse order just because of how the GitHub API works. And it didn't copy over any of the closed issues. So these are all things that are pretty straightforward to um, add <clears throat> once we have this basic um, GitHub issue migrator working. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so um, it's the 20 minute mark. We've just finished GitHub project migration. This is something that I have done and in the past for work and it doesn't just apply to GitHub. <clears throat> you may be migrating Jira tickets. You may be automating Jenkins jobs, like uh, fetching data from a Jenkins API. Basically every third party service has some kind of API will have it as a HTTP JSON API these days. And using Ammonite and Scala and the REPL, it's trivial not just to fetch data from the API, but also automate usage of the API. Such that if you want to, um, <clears throat> if you want to do something and like tell GitHub, hey, do this for me, I can just run the command in the REPL and immediately see the result in the browser without having to set up any heavyweight like project or framework or whatnot or build system. So that's GitHub project migration. Um, the last uh, example I'm going to show you is doing some parallel web calling. Um, so we're going to look at the graph of Wikipedia pages and starting from a given page, I want to find like all pages within, let's say one link or two links or three links from the starting page. And we're going to do so in parallel because Scala is good at concurrency and doing things in parallel. So to begin, um, <clears throat> Wikipedia also has an API. Um, if you start a Wikipedia API, um, there's documentation in here. Um, I'm not going to go through the details of the documentation, but I have it written down. So let me just reproduce it in the edit in the REPL. Um, so you can do request.get https um, n.wikipedia.org slash w slash api.php. Um, and then it demands some uh, metadata as URL parameters. So, so maybe, so action goes to query if you want to make a query. Um, title, let's say Singapore, because I'm in Singapore. And prop, I want to find the links. Uh, format, and I want it as JSON. So all this is documented in this uh, documentation page. So you can take a look at yourself if you wish to verify. Um, so if look at the red for two as a text. Uh, let's say I want to format it. 
Um, you can see that um, I get a JSON dictionary with uh, this continue structure probably for pagination. And then the query pages, uh, key value pair with some links. And then the links, each of which is an NS, maybe that means namespace and the title, which is what I want. Um, so for example, I may do um, read this and I want the query pages um, in this case, let's say like just dot, I want the object, please object get its values, uh, get, get its links. Uh, values maybe. Uh, <clears throat> and then I guess the last thing is I want to map uh, get the titles as a string. So here we have like a list of uh, the titles. The I guess we are ignoring pagination for now. By default, Wikipedia only provides the first 10 results. Um, but we, we made a request to Wikipedia API, mangle the JSON, and we have um, the first 10 outgoing links from the Wikipedia page for Singapore. Um, OK, great. So if you want to put this into a helper function, um, let's like def fetch links, uh, title string, uh, sequence of strings equals uh, indent this title. Uh, what's wrong here? Is extra paren here. Um, val response equals that. Um, and now I'm just going to paste this guy over, I guess. Um, it's a bit of a long query. You can, you can use a list comprehension if it looks better. Um, for now, I'm just using a, the map, flat map and map uh, to seek. Uh, OK, uh, now I can do fetch links Singapore. Seattle, Scala, and so on. OK, so <clears throat> now we have the ability to make one HTTP request to Wikipedia and Amnite Scala REPL and get some get the links, outgoing links of a particular Wikipedia article. Let's start doing the crawling. So let's say I want to do all pages within two links or three links. Uh, the easiest way to do kind of breadth first search. So if I do fetch, let's define the functions, fetch all links, start title as a string. Depth as an integer returns a set of string. Uh, a breadth first search, you'll need a scene set, which is by default the start title. And you need a current set, which is also the starting title. And I'm not going to keep an explicit queue. I'm just going to do a layer by layer breadth first search. So every layer, I'll make a bunch of HTTP requests and then aggregate them and then do a next, uh, the next layer of requests. So next title list equals for a title in current yield fetch links title. Let's put this here. Um, and then current equals next title list dot flatten dot filter scene dot contains. Um, and then scene equals scene plus plus current. And I return scene at the end. Um, so I do, I can argue fetch all links for Singapore, uh, depth zero, which returns Singapore. Depth one returns a few things that start with numbers. I guess these get sorted top of the list. Depth two, uh, takes a bit longer. Needs to make a bunch of requests sequentially. Um, okay. Something's wrong here. What's wrong with my breadth search? Um, Uh, I guess first someone asked a question. Let's look at the question. Uh, did you forget to look at the parameter? All, rec all results are the same. Yeah, so um, let's, let's take a look. Um, next title is start title. So this looks correct. Um, let me just add a print line. Add some print lines to debug this right, right, right now. Uh, print, print, print line, next title is. 
uh, fetch all links to a depth of two. Um, in fetch links. Oh, could that be why? <laughs> no, fetch links looks correct. Uh, fetch links. No, it's okay. Fetch links is definitely wrong. <laughs> okay, what's wrong? Uh, oh, because I, I hard coded. I hard coded this result. This should be the response. Okay, yeah, good. There we go. So now if I fetch link Scala, there we go. And now I get some proper results. Thank you. <laughs> um, Singapore, Seattle. Okay, great. Um, and that explains why when I was fetch all links was also not giving me the results I wanted. So now if I fetch all links for Singapore at depth one, I get that. Fetch all links Singapore at depth two, I get more results, uh, res 68 dot size. And I fetch things all at Singapore. I'm just going to time this val results time duration equals time. Uh, the REPL comes with a time built in, which is handy for things like this. Um, and this might take a while um, to run because it needs to do three layers, and the third layer does a whole bunch of requests. Um, what's this? Key not found links. Um, okay, so I guess fetch links I need to, I guess this is optional. So I need to do a bit more flattening to handle the optional optionality there. Um, define fetch all links again. And then fetch links. Come on, work this time. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, I think there's like a, maybe a few hundred or a thousand responses, so it may take a minute or so to get through all of them. Um, so how, let's see how long it took. This many nanoseconds, this many. So it took 25 nanoseconds to get to fetch 285 results. So about 100 milliseconds per result. Um, I guess that's what we'd expect, especially coming from Singapore. I, the speed of light is not going to change. So if the speed of light is not going to change, everyone is faster. One thing we can do is we can parallelize this. Um, although mo most many people write scrapers in all sorts of languages and frameworks using Python, using Ruby or using Bash. Um, trying to parallelize things using Python or Ruby is usually quite a pain in that um, even though it's not CPU bound, because threads don't, often don't work as well as you'd like, you often end up using multiprocessing to parallelize things. And when you use multiprocessing, your stack traces are awful, control C doesn't work. Um, basically, a lot of things don't work well when you parallelize Python or Ruby code. Um, on the other hand, Scala is meant to be good at parallelization. So let's see how to do that. Um, I just import scala.concurrent. Um, I can import the global execution context. Uh, and I'm just going to import uh, duration dot duration dot infinite so I can wait on the result later. Um, for now, we're just using a blocking th thread pool. Uh, if you want to use a async HTTP requests, that's possible as well. I mean, we can go through that if we have time. Um, and now I can just go back to fetch all links, uh, wrap this fellow in a future, uh, call, call it fetch all links futures, and say next title list equals next title list futures dot map uh, await dot result and duration. Format a bit more nicely. Let's call this fetch all links parallel. Uh, sorry, it's not duration. This should be infinite. Duration infinite. So 
I should be able to run fetch all links parallel on all the same things I ran fetch all links on and get the same results. So fetch all links Singapore one. So one is the same, two is the same. Two might take a bit longer. I'm not going to run fetch all links parallel for three. So I'm, going to, I'm not going to run fetch all links sequential for three because it's kind of slow, but we can do the same timing on timing thing on fetch all links parallel to see how long it takes now that we are parallelizing it. Uh, <clears throat> blah, fetch, fetch. So down from 25 seconds, it now takes uh, 3.8 seconds. So I guess that's not bad for, but, a two line code change, convert, wrapping this in future and adding a await the result at the end of it. Um, <clears throat> and I guess one other thing we could do that's kind of fun is um, earlier on we had scraped some uh, documentation from MDN. Uh, so I did like this guy with a dot take 10. Um, I put dot take 10 because otherwise it takes, otherwise it takes forever. But if you're going to parallelize it, it may be fast enough for us to deal with. So I'm going to call it scrape MDN uh, equals that. Uh, val futures equals that. Add some logging, print lines, scraping plus text. Uh, and then same futures dot map await dot result infinite. <clears throat> yeah, there's a limitation of the Scala wrapper where you can't do these futures directly. They must, have, they must be wrapped in the function. Um, that's just implementation detail, unfortunately. But now if you run scrape MDN, you can see it's parallel scraping all our results much faster than it was just now. Um, in this case, the default thread pool has one thread per core. On my laptop, there's eight cores, so, um, or eight virtual cores, so it has is doing the scraping eight ways parallel. You can tweak the parallelism by tweaking the thread pool or by using asynchronous, um, asynchronous HTTP. Um, just wait for this, it shouldn't take too much longer. So now res 84, we have scraped all 927 uh, the documentation pages of the Mozilla Development Network in maybe it took 10 seconds. So it's much faster thanks to the parallelism. And it's kind of a testament to how easy it is the parallelizing this Scala that could just chuck things in futures and tada, my program becomes eight, eight times faster without that much work. Um, so <clears throat> that's parallel web crawling. Um, this is a somewhat different style from what you may see in some of the other ways of writing Scala. If you're using like the pure functional pro programming style, you may turn your nose up at futures and oh, futures are impure. I have to use IO monad or ZIO monad or effect monad or whatever. And if you're using like the ACA reactive style, you may also turn your nose up and say, well, you're blocking on your futures. That's not reactive. That goes against our principles. But at the end of the day, I opened up my REPL and I parallel scraped 900 pages from Mozilla Development Network in. 10 seconds. And I did a parallel scrape of 285 Wikipedia articles in about three seconds. So that's what kind of shows you the power of Scala, even if you don't go to any of the extremes in terms of pure functionality, or pure functional programming of asynchronous like reactive programming, you can get a lot of very useful work done in the REPL in a very small amount of code. I and mean, I haven't even opened up my editor here and I've done these three things in the last half hour or so. Um, <clears throat> So in conclusion, I guess, apart from covering these those three use cases, the goal of this presentation is to show two things. One, working with Abinai is kind of fun. You can do these things at REPL. And it's not just about toy projects with like lists and linked lists and data structures in your program. Your REPL can reach out to the broader world and like talk to GitHub, tell GitHub to do something, fetch data from Wikipedia, fetch data from like the Mozilla Development Network. And you can like assimilate all this data together in the REPL in a very convenient fashion using Scala. And even third party libraries like JSOUP can just be pulled in when you need them and used on the spot. And I guess the other thing is to introduce like this kind of lightweight Scala programming as an alternative to the more, I believe, heavy, I would call heavyweight 
like pure functional styles or like reactive styles or even like the Twitter, Twitter util backend finagle styles, where each of those styles has a very big like cost to learn before you can become like good at them. You have to learn the, the way of doing things asynchronously, you have to learn, learn the Twitter way of doing things, you have to learn the uh, pure functional monadic way of doing things. Whereas if you look at the code here, if you throw this code at a random programmer just out of college, they can probably guess what the code is doing, even if they don't fully understand it. And that's kind of the power of Scala, this lightweight Scala style. You don't need, there is no onboarding process. You look at it, you know what it's going to do. You can immediately start using it productively and getting serious work done. Yeah, so I um, guess that's the end of the presentation. Thanks for listening. Um, in the interest of time, I only covered a small part of what you could do in the raffle. Um, a lot more of it is covered in the book. So if you're, I'm going to pitch the book. If you like what you saw here, there's more of it in the book. Please go take a look. Um, and you may see more things you like there too. Um, and I guess we still have a lot of time, so I'm happy to take any questions if anyone wants to ask or chit chat. Thanks. Uh, I don't know if you want to do voice questions or questions in the Q&A or chat room work too. It looks like you just explained it so well. <laughs> Nobody has any questions. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, yeah. thank you so much for, uh, it's it's your morning over there right now, correct? Yeah, it's 9.45 here. Not too Great. early. <laughs> Thanks for, yeah. for joining us. And uh, we really appreciate it, especially um, all the way from Singapore to Seattle here. Um, and everyone, yes, go check out handsonscala.com. And uh, we will see you next time. Cool, yeah. So if no questions, I'll, I'll log off there. And thanks, everyone. <laughs> yep. Bye.